In this video, we discuss compound interest, and we also discuss a limit definition of E. Limit definition of E, or one of the limit definitions of E, is intimately related to this formula for compound interest. So here's the idea with compound interest. Um, it says that the amount or the balance at time t, where t is measured in years, is equal to the principal, which is that initial investment, times uh, one plus the interest rate in decimal form, divided by the number of compoundings per year, um, all raised to the uh, number of compoundings per year um, times the number of years. And I think in principle, I think it's relatively easy to understand. Um, let's just look at this um, formula for n equals one. So if we say n equals one, what we're saying is only one time per year, we're going to um, add uh, interest uh, to the original balance and or to the original yeah, to the original amount that was deposited in the account. And then when we um, look at the balance after um, a year, then we're going to have that original amount plus um, that sort of percentage is associated with the interest rate. So here is an example. Um, when n is equal to 1 and p is equal to 1,000, r is equal to 3 point, uh, or 3.5%, and, and p is equal to 10 years, the first thing that we would do is we'd multiply, uh, or we'd write that 3.5 as 3.5%. Now, when you are writing, changing a percentage to a decimal form, um, we just move the decimal over twice, and you want to make the number smaller. So you're going to move the decimal um, from right to left. So the interest rate is 0 0.035 or 3.5%, same thing. And here is the idea. If you want to know uh, the amount in this account after depositing $1,000 at 3.5% after the first year, we would just evaluate this expression at t equals 1. And we would have that $1,000 times 1 plus the interest rate, which is that 3.5% uh, in decimal form divided by the number of compoundings per year raised to the first power. So basically what we're doing is we're saying, let's take that $1,000 and multiply by 1.035. Multiplying by one just means we still have the original $1,000 in the account. And then adding that 0 0.035 just means we're gonna add a 3.5% interest to the balance here. So if we do that, um, this is what we get. And when I multiply by 1,000, I just move the decimal over three times. So this ends up being $1,035 um, after that first year. Because basically, since I did one compounding per year, um, I'm just um, taking that 3.5% and adding that 3.5% to the original balance every year. So two years later, basically what we do is we take the amount that we had last year, was that 1.1 1. 1 plus uh, 0 0.035 uh, times that 1,000. So that's that $1,035. And then we multiply by that 1.035 again. So basically we're taking the amount at the end of the first year and we're multiplying that by at least 103.5% basically. We've got that 100%, which is the amount that was already in there. And then we were adding 3.5%. Uh, um, now, if I want to, I can use shorthand. I'm, I'm multiplying by that twice. So that's going to give us 1,000 times 1. 1.035 squared. And then if we continue in this way, after three years, we're just going to multiply by that 1.035 uh, again. Again, taking the balance from the last year. And then adding... Um, that 3.5% from the year, the previous year, or to the previous year's amount. And so here we've got 1,000 times 1 1.035. We're squaring that, and then when we multiply by that number again, we're end, we end up cubing it, and that's going to give us some number. 
And as we continue in this way, um, basically the expression for a at um, t equals one um, is is related to sort of this expression. Say, okay, well, what do we have um, for our formula for a of t in general? Well, we always start with that uh, principal amount. And then our this expression that we are raising to a power is that one plus the interest rate in decimal form. This is when n is equal to one. Oops, my paper, you're not seeing that. And then we say, okay, those are that's what's staying the same. And as our number t increases, when at the end of the first year, we're raising that to the first power. At the end of the second year, we're raising that to the second power. At the end of the third year, we're raising that to the third power. And so we can see that because we multiply by that 1.035 every year, um, after the, um, at year T, um, we've multiplied by that 1.035 uh, uh, or T times. We have that 1,000 times 1.035 uh, raised to the T. And then after 10 years, that was the what the question asked for. We're going to have 1,000 times 1.035 raised to the 10th power. And we can use a decimal, or we can use a calculator to get a decimal approximation of that. So I went to Desmos and I used the scientific calculator to get these decimal approximations of our answers. Um, but what we're asked for in this table is to see how this expression changes as the number of compoundings per year change. That when n is equal to one, we're looking for that balance for the account um, when p equals 1,000. So we um, made a $1,000 deposit and our interest rate is 3.5%. And we wanna know what would the balance be if we left that $1,000 in there for 10 years and compounded um, interest once per year. Um, well, then, according to our formula, uh, we get this $1,410.60 approximately. And so that's what we got. And again, we got that from computing 1,000 times 1.035 uh, raised to the 10th power. They might say, okay, well, what is this number of compoundings per year? Um, We'll see how that enters into our formula in just a moment. So we're going to do the same thing, but now this time, instead of looking at, instead of compounding interest once per year, we're going to do that twice per year. Um, so this is basically what we do. Actually, I need a little bit of trouble with my camera. Hold on just a second. Okay, so if we're compounding interest twice per year, basically we're going to use this formula again. Um, at the end of the first year, we'll have $1,000 times 1 plus the interest rate divided by the number of compoundings per year uh, raised to the number of compoundings per year times uh, the number of years, so that's 1. You might say, well, what does that mean? Well, basically what it means is we're taking this 3.5% and we're splitting it. We're splitting it into 1.75% uh, and then 1.75%. So what we do is six months into the year, um, we take our $1,000 and we multiply by that um, one point, um, well, it's gonna be a 1.75%. So this turns out to be, if I simplify it, So basically, we've taken that um, one thousand dollars and we've multiplied it by that um, uh, one point seven five percent. We did that at six months, and then we did it again. Um, at 12 months. And so at the end of the year, we've done that twice. Um, and that's why we've got that N times T uh, because we did it twice that year. Now for the second year, we're gonna do pretty much the same thing. Six months uh, after that, we've done it twice already. Now we're gonna do it again uh, for um, a year and uh, six months. And then we would do it again for that to get to the end of that second year. 
So we would end up with two times two there, the number of compoundings per year times the number of years. So that's just the number of times we compounded that interest, meaning like how many times did we take that 1.75% and uh, or take the original balance and multiply by 100% plus that 1.75%. And so we get this. So in general, after 10 years, I'm going to have 1,000 times that one plus that interest rate, which we divided into two pieces um, and made it uh, that 1.75%. And then after 10 years, because we've compounded interest twice per year, uh, we're going to multiply by that number uh, 20 times, uh, 10 times uh, two times or 20 times. And we can use a calculator to get a decimal approximation of each of these numbers. So I hope that makes sense. I hope you understand what it is we're doing. This formula says take the interest rate, divide it by the number of times you're going to compound interest, compound interest per year. And then um, imagine actually multiplying by this 1 plus r divided by n, um, n times during that first year, and then repeating that every year after that. Um, as you do that, um, this exponent is going to tell you the number of times interest has been compounded. This is the sort of factor that you're multiplying by every time you compound interest, and P is what you started with. Um, so basically, this number of compoundings per year, it's just telling you how many times you're compounding interest every year. When we talk about this R value, that's an annual interest rate. That's the interest rate that we're dividing by that number. Um, so this is saying every six months, do this. Um, we're taking that three and a half percent and splitting it in two. And when we do that, we actually get higher balances. So after typing that into my calculator and then just hitting enter, I got these amounts. Um, after 10 years, um, we've got that $1,000 plus our time, the one plus that interest rate divided by two. Um, and then we um, compounded interest twice per year for 10 years. So that's 20 times we've multiplied by this factor. And that gave us an amount of $1,414.78. That's what we've got here. We see it's just a little bit more than we got when um, we compounded interest once per year. So we just took that 3.5% and added it. Um, just once a year. Here, instead of doing a 3.5% at the end of the year, we did one and a half or 1.75% at six months and then 1.75% at uh, six months later. And of course, this, this number is a number of times interest has been compounded. Now, whenever you see in a problem statement, interest is compounded quarterly, what they're saying is that N is equal to four. So every three months, you're gonna compound interest. Um, again, the, the principle is the same. Um, you're just going to take that interest rate, that 3.5%, you're gonna divide by four. Um, so that's gonna give you the interest rate for one quarter. And then you're gonna multiply by that uh, one plus the um, interest rate for the particular quarter, you're going to multiply that by that four times during the first year at three months and then at six months and then at nine months and then at 12 months. And then you'll get the amount at the end of the year. And you'll see that after that first year, which is when T equals one, um, we see that we actually make more money uh, during that first year if we compound interest more often. So when we looked at um, just compounding at interest once per year, we ended up with that $1,000 plus three and a half percent of that. So $1,035 at the end of the first year. When we um, compounded interest twice per year, instead of having $1,035, we got $1,035.31. So we got 31 cents more. It's not very much more, but we got 31 cents more um, from compounding interest twice per year as opposed to um, once per year. Um, and then with n equals to four, we're going to do pretty much the same thing. So our p value is the same. Principal amount is the same. 
Now, um, at the end of the first year, we're going to have that $1,000 times one plus the interest rate divided by four. And they've got uh, raised to the fourth because we are multiplying by that value four times. And I actually don't know what that is when I divide a 35 by four. Um, what is that? 0 0.08. And then we'll have a 30. Ah, I don't know. I don't want to do the arithmetic. Well, let's do the arithmetic just in case. We've got that. We're dividing by four. Uh, four goes into uh, 35. Eight times. Bring down the zero. Four goes into uh, 37 times. And four goes into 25 times. All right. Um, so this ends up being 0. Uh, 0.00875. So it's not even 1%. It's at 0.875% that we're multiplying by, or one plus that 0.875% that we're multiplying by every four months, or excuse me, every three months. And then we do this four times um, during that first year. And then during the second year, we do it four more times. And then the third year, we do it four more times with that. And so every year, um, this exponent goes up by four. So at the end of 10 years, we're going to have that $1,000. And then we've multiplied by that 0.875%. Um, or we've added a 0 0.875 uh, percent um, 10 times four times because we've done it for 10 years, four times per year. Um, and of course, you have the original balance as well. And that's that that's that one represents. So you've got 100 percent of what you started with plus um, this uh, 0.875 uh, percent that's being added every quarter. And if we use a desk or if we use a graphing calculator or a scientific calculator, excuse me, um, we can find out what that amount is. Um, so this is what I got when I used my calculator. So now that we understand this formula and what it's representing, like what it's actually doing to our money as we're multiplying by this uh, one plus R over N, um, n times per year. And we can just apply the formula for n equals 12. This is what we would, um, this is the amount that we would get if we were compounding interest every month. So basically we're gonna take our 3.5%, we're going to uh, divide it by 12, and we're gonna take the original amount, which was 1,000, and we're gonna uh, multiply by one plus that 3.5% divided by 12. So that's 0 0.035 divided by 12. And then you're going to say, how many times did we um, compound interest if we did that 12 times per year for 10 years? Well, 120 times. So we're going to multiply by this extra factor 120 times in the course of 10 years if we're compounding interest monthly. Um, so we can use our calculator to compute this number. And that's what I'm doing over here. I actually don't know what... Uh, 0 0.035 is divided by 12. So I'll just write that. So I get that number. Um, I want one plus that number as the number that I'm raising to a particular power. So I'm just going to copy and paste that number here. Now these are the numbers for, um, uh, for four compounding per year. But if I just want to look at 12, and so we're doing, we're compound, compounding interest 12 times per year, we'd raise that to the 12th to get the amount after the first year. We'd raise that to the 24th to get the amount after the second year. We'd raise that to the 36th to get the amount after the third year. And then after 10 years, it would be 120 years, or excuse me, 120 times that we were compounding that interest. Uh, so what we get is uh, for 10 years, 
uh, one thousand four hundred and eighteen dollars and thirty four cents. And we see that if we compounded interest uh, 12 times during that first year, instead of $1,035, we've got $1,035.57. So somehow we've made 57 cents of additional interest uh, because we compounded, compounded interest uh, 12 times per year. Now for our table, we're also asked to say, what, what if our interest is compounded daily? That would be 365 times um, then we would just use the same formula of what $1,000 and add or multiply by one plus the interest rate divided by 365. And then we're going to um, raise that to the 365 times um, the number of years, uh, which is 10 years. So we're going to multiply by that extra factor, 365 times 10. Um, times uh, because we're doing this for 10 years, 365 during the first year, 365 plus 365 during the second year, and so on and so forth. Um, now, I don't actually know what that that decimal is if we have a 365 in the denominator, but we can do that. We'll make that a 365, make that a 365, that a 365, and that a 365. And then because we're uh, compounding interest daily, so 365, um, well, to multiply by that factor, 365 times during the first year, and then 365 times two during the second year, and 365 times three during the third. And I guess we're not going to account for leap year. <laughs> uh, 365 times 10 uh, for the 10th year. And we get that 400 or 1,400. Um, and $19.04. And of course, these are all approximate. So, well, uh, compounding 365 times gave us uh, $1,419. Compounding once per year gave us uh, $1,410. We only made nine more dollars. Um, it's not really that much, not, not really that big of a difference. Um, that has something to do with the interest rate, the amount that we started with, and the fact that it was only 10 years because that interest rate was so low. Um, but we see that compounding it more often is actually very helpful. And we'd say, okay, well, what about continuous compounding? Well, if we do this, not just, uh, not just daily and not just every hour or every minute or every second, but continuously, we use uh, the natural base E and we will... Uh, use this formula to come up with a limit definition of E or to define E in just a moment. Um, but if I'm using the continuous compounding formula, so we're com compounding interest every moment, um, we're going to just substitute these values of P, R, and T, where R is in decimal form into this formula, and it's going to give us um, the amount that we would get if we were compounding interest continuously for 10 years. So this is gonna be um, A of 10, equals the principle of 1,000 times e to the 0 0.035 times 10. And if we type that into our calculator here, we get um, 1,000. Did I do that right? No, I, I, I wrote times 1. There we go. Uh, $1,419.07 as opposed to four cents. So um, compounding interest uh, 365 times a year uh, versus compounding continuously only leads to a difference of three cents. Um, so, so doing it every moment, every possible moment, um, except making it continuous as opposed to um, discrete um, gets us three more cents three additional cents than we um, would get if we were compounding interest daily. Yeah. This suggests a limit definition of E in the natural base. The claim is that as N goes to infinity, this expression approaches this expression. So the P factor is still there. Um, and this one plus R divided by N raised to the NT the claim is that as n goes to infinity, that expression approaches e raised to the rt. 
So I'd say, how can I actually show that this expression approaches that expression? Or how can I maybe get rid of the P, get rid of the R, get rid of the T, and just examine what E is? Um, well, we can think about um, using this compound interest formula and starting with a single dollar. And then we're saying, okay, if I'm going to start with a single dollar and I compound interest n times per year, and my interest rate is 100%. So, that, so if we're only compounding once per year, at the end of the year, I get $2 instead of $1. Because um, no, I have the original dollar, oh, and then I'm adding that dollar again, that 100%, yeah. um, with t equals one year. If we use t equals one year, um, that interest rate of 100% and that $1, well, this is just a one, and then we have one plus the interest rate in decimal form, which is one, divided by the number of compoundings per year, raised to the number of compoundings per year times t. If t equals one, um, that's just going to be an n there. So it's just going to be the number of times that we've multiplied by that um, during that first year. Um, so what we end up with um, when n equals 1 is this. So we had we started with a dollar. And then we're uh, multiplying by 1, which is that giving us that 100% of that dollar that we started with. And then we're adding 100% interest. So basically, we're adding 1 divided by 1 which is just adding a second dollar. So we end up with one times two, which is two. So we end up with $2 at the end of the first uh, year. Now, if we sort of ignore that, uh, but imagine compounding twice per year and then n times per year, 12 times per year uh, daily, and then every hour and then every minute and then every second, um, we can see um, that this expression, which is one plus one divided by n raised to the n, approaches the number e. Um, compounding um, increasing numbers of times doesn't increase the balance indefinitely. Like you might think, oh, well, if it doubles it after the first year, maybe this is eventually going to go to infinity or something like that. If n, as n goes to infinity, maybe this quantity goes to infinity. It doesn't. It actually approaches the natural base e. Now, if I evaluate this expression at n equals 2, we're going to have a 2 there and a 2 there. If we evaluate at n equals 4, we'll have a 4 there and a 4 there. 12, we'll have 12 there and a 12 there. 365, we'll have 365 there and a 365 there. We've got that 8760 there and 8760 there. 525,600 there. Same exponent. Not totally, but it's then we have that big. amount. That's the number of seconds in a year. Yeah, I know. Rock and roll. Basically, what this is giving us is the amount in that account. If we started with a dollar, if we had 100% interest, and we are compounding that interest once per year, twice per year, four times per year, monthly, daily, every mo hour, every minute, every second. And as we evaluate this, evaluate these expressions um, using calculator on Desmos, we're going to get a number. And that dollar amount is actually going to approach the value of E, as we'll see um, on our uh, scientific calculator online. So let's do that. Now, on Desmos, we can do this much more efficiently than we've done it here. And we can use sliders for the value of P. That's that principal amount that we've um, uh, invested. Then R is our interest rate. Usually it's just a number between 0 um, and 100%. When we talk about a 100% interest rate, which is what we need in the limit definition of E, R is equal to 1. 100% in decimal form is just a 1. N is the number of times we're compounding interest per year. And then T is the number of years. So if we do that, and we can actually have Desmos create a table for us. Um, and this is what we get. Um, if we compound interest twice per year, or excuse me, once per year, we get this value, which Desmos is simplified to $2. Um, twice per year, it's this uh, 1 plus 1 half squared, or 3 halves squared. If I take three halves and I square it, I get nine divided by four, which is that 2.25 that they have. So that's $2.25. If I take my one plus one fourth, and that's 1.25, and I multiply that by itself four times, 
Um, Desmos does the calculation for us. We get approximately $2.44 um, at the end of that first year. If we do that 12 times, so we take one plus uh, one twelfth, and we raise that to the 12th power because that one twelfth is um, sort of that, that percentage that we're multiplying by. It's in a fraction, the form of a fraction uh, rather than being a percentage, but that's what we're, we're taking that 100% interest and we're dividing it into 12 equal pieces. And then we'll say, okay, let's do that. And we'll multiply by that number 12 times. So what happens to our dollar at the end of that um, 12 month period? Um, our dollar is now worth two dollars and sixty three or sixty one cents. Um, then for three sixty five, we get uh, two seventy one approximately. Um, if we compound interest every um, hour, we get uh, two point uh, seven one uh, eight or two point seven two approximately. And then uh, for that five hundred twenty five thousand six hundred, that's every minute. We still have that two dollars and seventy two cents, and then um, every second it's this, still two dollars and seventy two cents. But now, if I ignore the money part and I just focus on that decimal approximation, what I want you to see is, um, let's compare that to e, just the number e. So that number at the bottom, when we're compounding interest every second, is approximately two point seven one eight two eight one eight. Well, that's exactly what we have for the first um, seven de decimal places after the decimal point for that um, approximation of E using the um, graphing calculator. So we have at least out to the seventh decimal, uh, seventh place after the decimal point, um, this uh, expression um, and E agree with each other. So we can always think of it as computing this limit uh, of one plus one over N um, raised to the N um, numerically, um, we're not actually computing the limit, we're estimating the limit. We're saying, okay, if n gets larger and larger and larger, what happens to that value? Well, it's it's approaching not just this value, but that 2.7818 or 2.7182818, no, which is um, consistent with our, our value of e. Um, so this is a limit definition of e. If you see an expression like this, um, you can... Um, you can count on it um, actually um, representing E. Now we can also prove that this limit definition is equal to E by taking letting Y equal this limit, then taking the log of both sides using our log properties, um, and then evaluating the limit from there. If we do that, we'll find that the answer or the value of this limit is E. So let's do that on paper. So to show that this limit actually equals E, we're going to let Y equal this, and then we'll take the logarithm of both sides. So when I take the log of both sides, I have this, and the logarithm of a limit is the limit of the logarithm. So you can pull the logarithm inside that limit notation. Then we can use that exponent property to bring the n out front. And so what we get is um, the limit as n goes to infinity of n times the natural log of one plus one over n. As n goes to infinity, of course, n goes to infinity. Then we'll have one plus one over n. One over n will go to zero. So we end up with natural log of one, which is zero because e to the zero power is one, right? So this is an infinity times zero indeterminate form. And say, well, how do I evaluate that? Well, we just put that n in the denominator. So multiplying by n is the same as dividing by one over n. And now instead of having an infinity times zero indeterminate form, you've got a zero over zero indeterminate form. And L'Hopital's rule is appropriate. So we'll use L'Hopital's rule. So we take the derivative of the numerator. And actually, we shouldn't be should be careful about this. And um, we have a tendency to um, use L'Hopital's rule whenever we're taking the derivative of something or when we're able to take the derivative of something. Um, we really shouldn't take derivatives of expressions involving n if n is supposed to be a natural number, um, a counting number, essentially. Uh, it doesn't make sense to take the derivative of this point. So I'm just going to write this as a limit as x goes to infinity of the same expressions. But instead of n's, I'm going to have x's. Okay, so because if our 
um, sequence has the same values as our function, the limit of the function of a real variable x is the same as the limit of the sequence. So we can justify that choice. And the derivative of a logarithm is one divided by whatever is inside. And then we multiply by the derivative of the inside by the chain rule. And that derivative of the denominator is not even something that we have to evaluate because the derivative of the denominator is a factor of the numerator. So we'll reduce those and we'll say, well, what happens to this expression as X goes to infinity? This expression goes to zero. And so we end up with a one. So natural log of Y is equal to one. So if I want to get Y by itself, we exponentiate essentially. So Y is equal to E. So that tells us that E is equal to this limit as N goes to infinity of one plus one over N raised to the nth power. Now, if I raise both sides of this equation to the T, I've got this. Now, um, because exponential functions are continuous, uh, we can bring this t inside. This expression raised to the t is the same as the limit of this expression raised to the t. And if I'm taking a power and raising it to a power, I just multiply those together. So e to the t is this. And then I claim okay. that e to the rt is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus r divided by n raised to the nt. Now we can show that that's true um, if we, um, actually, I think I'd probably ignore the t and then just look at this expression of 1 plus r divided by n raised to the n and show that that's going to be equal to e to the r. So let's do that. Let's let y equal the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus r divided by n raised to the n. And we'll take the logarithm of both sides. It's exactly the same technique as before. The logarithm of y is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the logarithm of this expression. You can bring the n out front. Okay, and now we've got an infinity uh, times zero indeterminate form again. Um, because this is going to infinity. Uh, as n gets very large, if r is just some fixed constant, this fraction is getting small. So we're going to get a zero uh, here, and we'll have natural log of 1, which is approaching zero. Or natural log of 1 is zero, but as n goes to infinity, if this is approaching zero, this entire expression is approaching zero. So we'll take the limit as n goes to infinity of uh, this instead. I don't want an infinity times zero in determinate form. I would rather have um, an zero over zero in determinate form. Now this is a zero over zero in determinate form. So we can apply L'Hopital's rule, but that requires differentiation. So we'll switch to a real variable X as opposed to um, a natural number N. So by L'Hopital's rule, this is the limit as X goes to infinity of the derivative of the numerator, which is one divided by one plus r divided by n times the derivative with respect to x of r divided by, or sorry, I wrote r divided by n, r divided by x. Hence the limit with respect, or derivative with respect to x of r divided by x. And we're taking all of that and we're dividing by the derivative with respect to x of one divided by x. To say, okay, well, what's the relationship between this and this? Well, this, has just, this just has an extra factor of R. Um, so we can um, factor out that R. So the limit as X goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over R um, divided by X times R. 
times the derivative of one over x. All divided by the derivative of one over x. And just like before, those derivatives cancel, but I factored out the r. They say, okay, well, what happens to that as x goes to infinity? Uh, this guy goes to zero. And we just end up with r divided by one, which is r. So we have the natural log of y is equal to r, and y was that limit that we were interested in. If we exponentiate on both sides, we have y is equal to e to the r. Um, so um, the limit as n goes to infinity of p times 1 plus r divided by n raised to the nt is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of p times the quantity 1 plus r over n raised to the n raised to the t because of our exponent properties. When we're multiplying those exponents together, so that's the same thing as taking a power and raising it to a power. So I can sort of factor that like that. And this turns out to be e to the rt, or excuse me, e to the r. And then applying this property again, or that uh, limit of that expression um, is e to the r. And so we get p times e to the r raised to the t, which is p e to the rt. All right. So that is what we get. That's where our continuous compounding um, formula comes from. And that is how we can show um, that if I take the limit of my compound interest formula for when we're compounding interest n times per year, and I take its limit as n goes to infinity, I get this. And then we can say, of, also, if we just ignore that compound interest idea, then we have just a 1 here for r and an n here of we'll 1 plus 1 over n raised to the n. As n goes to infinity, that just approaches e. Now for problems 90, 91, and 92, it's pretty much the same thing that we did with problem 89. We're using that compound interest formula and then we're showing um, what the balance is in the account after T years with R percent interest um, for this uh, principal um, investment. Um, we wanna know what that um, amount, that balance would be after T years. And then we also want to find out what that balance would be if um, interest is compounded continuously as opposed to being compounded um, N times per year. Um, so for n equals, or excuse me, for a problem number 90, when n equals 1, uh, we have the P, which is 2,500. So we're imagining we're investing $2,500. And then we're multiplying by 1 plus that interest rate, which is 6%, or 0 0.066 in decimal form. And we're just, we're just going to add that 6% for that first year if we're only compounding interest once per year. So we're taking that 2,500 and we're multiplying by 1.06 to get the 2,500 back plus an extra 6%. And then we're gonna multiply by that um, 20 times because at the end of every year, um, we multiply by this 1.06, which is giving us 100% of what we already have plus an additional 6%. We do that 20 times if we're uh, um, compounding interest uh, once per year for 20 years, and that's gonna give us some value. Now, there's an easier way to do this. I think we all know how to use this formula now. We put the 2,500 in. We have one plus the interest rate. We divide by the number of compoundings per year. And then this number in the exponent is the number of times we're compounding interest per year times the number of years, which would give us the total number of times we multiplied by this extra factor. Um, so if n is equal to two, and we're doing this for 20 years, we're going to take our 6% and divide it by 2. So we're adding 3% every six months to the amount that we have in our account. And then we're going to do that for 20 years. Since we're doing it twice per year, that means we're going to multiply by that extra factor 40 times. And we do the same thing for four times per year. Or quarterly is what it usually says. We'll take that 6%. We'll divide it by 4. That's going to be 1.5% uh, every quarter. And so you multiply by this 100% um, 
plus the 1.5% um, of the amount that you already have. And you do that four times per year for 20 years. So you're going to do that 80 times, and that's going to give you um, some particular account balance. So we know how to use this formula now. Uh, we can actually use uh, our calculator uh, to compute all of these values for us relatively simply. Um, it's, it's pretty easy. Um, I'll show you now. Um, basically, what I've done is I've created sliders on Desmos uh, to represent the p-value, the r-value, the n-value, and the t-value. So what we can do is we can change the p-value using our sliders. I'm going to let my p equal 2,500. My interest rate is 6%. I'm going to type that in decimal form, 0 0.06. N is just, I'm going to leave N as 1. And then T is 20 in this case. And then basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to populate that table with all of the values. Um, now this is from before. This is from when we were looking at this expression when R was equal to 1, P was equal to a dollar, and T uh, was equal to one year. And then we were letting N vary. Um, now, rather than doing that, we're actually talking about an investment of $2,500 at 6% uh, per year, compounded N times per year uh, for 20 years. So I've, I've set my sliders for that P value, the R value, and T value. And then it automatically populates this table with values. So that 2,500, let's do the calculation. Um, using the calculator, we'd have 2,500 plus 1.06 when we're compounding once per year. We're going to do that for 20 years. And we get that $8,017.84. That's what I'll write down on my paper. And we see that that's the value that Desmos is giving us for compounding interest once per year. Now, if I'm compounding interest twice per year, we're taking that 6% and we're dividing it by 3, or excuse me, dividing it by 2 to get 3%. And then instead of doing that 20 times, we're going to do that uh, 40 times in 20 years because we're doing it twice per year for 20 years. And so we get that uh, 1000 or excuse me, $8,155.09 approximately. And in general, uh, for the next one, with four times per year, we're taking our 6%, we're dividing by four. Then we're taking that uh, four times per year, and we're multiplying by the number of years, which is uh, 20 in this case. And we get that um, $8,226.66. And so... Um, the problem statement for problem number 90 just asked us to look at uh, once per year, twice per year, um, quarterly, monthly, and then uh, daily. And this table actually populates with all of those values provided that you change the values of P, R, and T up here. You can leave the N value alone because the N value is actually changing in this table. I'm using N sub one rather than N when I'm populating the table with these values. But the calculator is actually doing the heavy lifting. I just wanted to make sure that we understood what the calculator was doing before we just read some values from a table. Um, so we've got this table. When n equals 12, um, according to our table, we get this $8,275.51. And when n equals 365, we've got um, $8,299.47. Um, so we started out with $2,500, or $100, and we left it alone for 20 years. If we leave that uh, twenty or that $2,500 alone for 20 years, and we're getting 6% interest on it per year, at the amount um, in the account, the account balance after um, that 20 years, will be given by these numbers in the um, column on the right. Um, and that's when we're compounding this number of times per year. So compounding more means our, our final balance is more than it was before. And if we want to, we can take that balance that we just found and we can subtract that 2,500 and we can see actually how much interest we made. So if we um, compounded interest 365 times per year, 
um, we actually made uh, $5,799.47 in interest. Or if we only compounded once per year, we would still make $5,517.84 in interest. Um, that's because our interest rate is so high um, and because we left the money alone for 20 years. Now, uh, if you're think thinking $8,000 is not very much, uh, I would I would prefer to have a much higher balance than you actually have to invest more than the $2,500. And it would be uh, better to invest more often as opposed to investing just once and leaving it alone for 20 years. Uh, so I think that's that's the idea. Um, you get this, you can do the same thing um, for um, problem number 91. In problem number 91, the principal is $1,000. You're investing $1,000. The interest rate is 5%. And you're doing this for 30 years. And then we've got these values for the amount um, in, or the account balance after 30 years. And if we want to, we can subtract that initial uh, principal and we can see how much interest we earned. Um, but this, uh, this second column here, is giving us that account balance. Um, and we see that we started with, what, $1,000? And then if we're compounding once per year, we get 4, 000, we'll get have $4,321.94 remaining. And then if we do that, if we have are compounding interest um, every day uh, for 20 years, we have $4,481.23. Um, so you, you really only make uh, a little bit more. You make about $160 more if you're compounding interest daily as opposed to compounding once per year. Um, but uh, yeah, you can see that we still made uh, between $3,300 um, in interest and uh, $3,400 uh, 3, uh, $3, in interest approximately if we're compounding that often. And of course... Um, we get even better uh, amounts if we're compounding interest continuously. Um, so we would just use our PERT formula, that principal times E raised to that interest rate in decimal form times T to get the amounts uh, for continuous compounding. Now for problem number 92, the principal is 4,000. The interest rate is 4% and the number of years is 15 years. But again, we just pick those values and our table auto populates with all those values that we want. Um, so our account balance will be $7,203.77. You're compounding once per year. $7,245.45 twice per year and so on. You're just gonna write those values from uh, for n equals one, two, four, 12, and 365 um, in your table on your, um, no, to get your final answer. Now for each of those problems, um, we can use our compound uh, or interest formula for continuous compounding. Um, we've got P equals 1,000, 2,500, 1,000, and 4,000. Our interest rates are 3.5%, 6%, 5%, 4%, and then 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and 15 years. If we substitute those into the formulas, we get the amounts for um, continuous compounding in each case. Um, so for the first case, we have $1,419.07, uh, which is... Um, only three cents more than compounding um, daily, uh, as we saw um, when we computed all of those values in our table for n equals 365. That's for problem 89. And then for problem 90, um, the account balance after 20 years is $8,300 um, and 29 cents. And the account balance, um, if we compound daily, um, is $8,299.47. So we make less than a dollar uh, more um, if we're compounding continuously as opposed to daily. Um, and then for um, problem 91, uh, the account balance uh, for compounding continuously is $4,481.69. And the account balance of, that's after 30 years 
if we're compounding 365 times per year, so daily, um, we have $4,481.23. So it's seriously, the difference is like the difference between 69 cents and 23 cents. It's a very, very small difference um, compounding daily versus compounding continuously. And then for problem number 92, uh, we've got uh, $7,288.24 if we're compounding 365 times per year. And uh, the same dollar amount with uh, 48 cents. So we're only making 24 extra cents if we're compounding uh, continuously as opposed to uh, daily. Uh, my understanding actually is that um, when a bank keeps your money that they're compounding interest uh, daily. Um, I might be wrong, uh, but I think I think they are compounding interest daily. Um, we see that that difference uh, between the continuous compounding uh, formula and the um, and compoundings per year for 365 days compounding um, interest daily. Is, is pretty much the same, uh, but um, and that's it. That's it for our, our discussion of compound interest. And we also know how to calculate E now. It turns out to be the limit as N goes to infinity of one plus one divided by N, all, close parentheses, all raised to the N. Um, and now we, we can see how that compound interest formula is related to the limit definition of E.